Welcome to our webinar, where we will discuss merchant risk and the growth of corporate PPAs. This webinar follows the release of our thought leadership report, the future of renewable energy, renewable power generation, merchant risk, and the growth of corporate PPAs, and events in London and Singapore. We have an excellent panel of experts for you this morning. And from the number of people of joining us today, I can tell it's a really burning issue for renewable developers and suppliers in Greece. My name is Virginia Murray and I'm your host for today. I'm head of the Greek Law Project and Structured Finance Team at WFW in Athens. I've been a Greek law for lawyer for nearly 23 years now and active in the renewable energy sector in Greece since 1999. Before we start, a couple of housekeeping points that you will also have seen on our holding slide. Uh, participant video and audio has been disabled to minimize interruptions. But of course, if you would like to pose a question or comment to any of our presenters, please use the Q&A function. I've set aside 20 minutes for questions. So please feel free to post those questions throughout the session so that we can move straight into responding to as many as possible. The slides that you'll see today will be emailed to you following the event and the webinar will be recorded. So briefly, let me set out where we are now. Uh, the target model has been implemented in Greece and the day ahead and intraday markets have been operating since the 1st of November, 2020. Uh, renewable energy electricity has been participating in those markets, currently about 75% of that which is the electricity generated under the old feed-in tariff. It's represented by VAPEP and registered market aggregators or market representatives, as they're known in other countries, represent the generation which participates directly in the market. Of that, only 2% has remained with the aggregator of last resort, which is VAPEP again. Renewables have had balancing obligations since the beginning of 2020. In January, Greece's elect average electricity price was the third lowest in Europe, driven mainly by the high generation of renewables, including PPC's large hydro units, and the good weather in Greece throughout January, which reduced demand. Prices have obviously increased in February, driven by the worse weather and media. The single day ahead market coupling has also started with Italy in the pan-European day ahead power market. Balancing costs are still high, and RAI has introduced measures to try to address this. The press is reporting that other measures are also on the table. Um, as you'll know, renewables and aggregators do not yet participate in the balancing market. We at Watson Farley and Williams in Athens have been supporting developers, sponsors, investors, and banks in the Greek renewables market since 1999. But the explosion of interest in the Greek renewables market we've seen in the last two years, I think Panayos will agree is unprecedented. The ministry has indicated that it views the enabling of bilateral PPAs as a priority for this year and has proposed that high energy consuming corporates, those whose energy costs represent more than 20% of their overall manufacturing or operating costs should be able to purchase green energy through the market. But the related balancing costs should be subsidized through the COVID recovery fund. This would of course require EU state aid consent. Greece doesn't have heavy industry to absorb its energy, though it does have companies with high energy costs, including those in the tourism industry. The credit worthiness of those companies may be difficult for generators and funding banks to assess. So I'm looking forward to hearing our panel's view on how credit risks have been assessed in other markets, such as the new Spanish guarantee mechanism. So in summary, we have a lot of exciting topics to discuss in a very short time. So I'm going to turn the webinar over to our panel members. We're honored to be able to present to you a very highly expert panel. Uh, Thomas Twoman is the European PPA lead at Green Investment Group. He's responsible for origination and structuring of both corporate and utility PPAs for GIG's investments and has more than a decade of PPA experience across hydro, wind and solar PV technologies. 
Prior to joining Macquarie, Thomas held a senior commercial role with GE Renewable Energy, leading PPA origination activities in Europe. Before that, he worked for Statcraft as a senior originator, structuring and marketing energy derivative solutions in Nordic countries. Zosia Reisner has been director of Power Markets Europe at LightSource since 2016 and is responsible for all power marketing activities in the UK, Republic of Ireland, Netherlands, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Greece, and Poland. Zosia gained a deep understanding of the energy markets, including corporate energy procurement and risk management, as well as offtake arrangements for renewable assets while at Utilix, an energy consultancy, and has been actively involved in the UK corporate market, PPA market, since the beginning in over a decade, over a decade ago. Under her direction, the PPA team at LightSource for BP have secured and negotiated PPAs in the UK and Spain. Panayotis Papastamatiu will be known to many of you as Chief Executive Officer of the Hernik Wind Energy Association, El Atayen. His day job is as Director of Enteca Group, where he directs the development and financial sectors of the group. Panayotis has been involved in the renewable energy sector in Greece, particularly in wind energy, pretty well since it started. And he also has expertise across the Balkans. In the past, he's worked as an advisor for the Hellenic Ministry of Development, as well as for other public and private corporations. He's an electrical engineer with a PhD in operational research and energy policy and planning, as well as further courses in economics and management. He's also a board member of the Greek Association of Res Electricity Producers. And for the home team, Henry Stewart, is co-head of Watson, Farley and Williams Global Energy and Infrastructure Sector and a partner in the London Energy and Infrastructure Group. His transactional experience includes project finance, acquisition finance and syndicated lending, joint venture work and private M&A. He has a particular focus on transactions in the renewable sector where he acts for leading banks, funds and sponsors who are active in solar, onshore and offshore wind and biomass. He also has experience in conventional power, mining, and oil and gas transactions. So, Panayoti, you very much have your finger on the pulse of the market here in Greece. Um, I wonder if you could give us a short introduction on what will be the key drivers and key concerns on the rollout of corporate PPAs in the Greek market. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you for the invitation in this interesting discussion, which is very attractive for our sector and this is proven also for, from the big number of audience. Uh, I would like to start with a very preliminary comment and then I will share some, um, some slides. Uh, the, the, the complete the integration of renewables in the market is the inevitable path for a high penetration with lower cost for the consumer for renewables. And indeed, even in, uh, in our country since uh, some years now, uh, the new renewables power plants uh, we participate directly in the market, having uh, full balance responsibilities and market obligations. This applies also to the power plants who are uh, selected through the auctions and uh, have uh, awarded uh, fitting premium contracts. When our market will be mature and will have all the tools in place, uh, all these projects, including the project from the auctions, will have full market obligations. Uh, from this point of view, corporate PPAs uh, is um, an interesting alternative for our project to be financed if they have not secured a fitting premium contract through an auction. So as a sector, we are very interested in the development of this, of this market. Uh, of course, um, we need to learn more and learn a lot. And uh, I'm looking forward to learn through the discussion as well because one of the fundamental problems of our market in Greece is that uh, the truth is that we lack um, know-how, we lack the culture of the liberalization, because it is true that all the process of the liberalization of the electricity market in Greece had delayed for decades, so we didn't have the opportunity to build the know-how and the culture to participate in this market. Of course, our sector is already mature, from a technological and economic point of view, 
and uh, we are ready to participate in this. Uh, my comments does not imply that we are not ready to participate in the market on the opposite. Uh, the, the, only, the, the, only, uh, value, the only point in this comment is that uh, all the, all the uh, uh, companies of our sector need to invest in human resources and in know-how in order to develop all these new capabilities to participate in an effective way in the market for the benefit of our investments and the benefit of the consumers. Now, one fundamental question is what is the potential market of uh, the, the, corporate, the, the future corporate PPAs? So I will share now some of my, trans some of my slides. Uh, okay. Where we stand right now, right now, um, at the end of 2020, there are go, we had in operation, we have in operation almost uh, 7.5 giga of wind and photovoltaics, 3.2 photovoltaics, 4.1 giga of wind energy. These are projects either with wind in tariff, may, may, the, may, the big percentage of them, or with uh, feeding premiums administratively defined feeding premiums or feeding premium contracts, very few, awarded through auctions. Within the last two years, we had two, three years, we had the 13 auctions through RAE, very successful, I have to say, auctions, uh, from which uh, 2.7 gigawatt of photovoltaics and wind had been selected. Uh, there was a decrease in the prices right now, we have um, uh, prices in the last auctions from uh, around 50 to 55 uh, euros per megawatt hour. Uh, I will say that uh, most of mo mo all these projects have been are split in, in the half. Half of them, 1.4, are for wind, 1.2, 1.3 are for photovoltaics. So we can say that these projects have somehow um, hedged their risk. Of, the ex, of their exposure to the day ahead to the wholesale market, not their balancing risk, of course. They will they will exposed in their balancing risk. Apart from that, according to the recent announcement of the ministries at the end of the previous year, uh, we are expecting to have an extension of the auction procedure up to at least the end of 2024 for 2.1 gigawatt more of photovoltaics and wind. And on top, we have uh, in front of us uh, a, a, an announced auction for 30, 50, 350 megawatt for photovoltaics and wind by May 21. Moreover, the ministry have, uh, has announced that the new uh, auction scheme up to the end of uh, 24 will have so will incorporate some improvement in its architectures. It needs architecture, and we are waiting to see these improvements. On the other hand, we have the targets uh, through for 2030 from the National Energy Climate Plan. We're expecting that these targets will be increased after the increase of the overall European target for the reduction of the CO2 emissions. But currently, the figures we have on the table are for uh, 7 gigawatt for, for uh, wind up to 2030 and 7.7 .7 gigawatt for the photovoltaics. What does this mean? This means that Without taking into consideration the expected in increase of the target, we have a gap, we have a, a room for almost 1.5, 1.4 gigawatt wind and photovoltaics, which will not be selected through auction, we will not be awarded with, from a feeding premium contract. And most probably this will be a potential market for the corporate PPAs. On top of this, we will have the increased of the target of uh, 2030, and of course, we have capacities, possible capacities, uh, beyond these targets. Still, as I told before, there are some fundamental questions who are uh, looking forward to investigate and to, to try to understand, to gain more understanding of this. I have tried to put on uh, this slide some of these questions. There are some structural questions how we structure a, a corporate PPA, which will be in Greece, the counterparty 
as Virginia told, we don't have large uh, industrial consumers. We have very few large industrial consumers. So I will say that I will expect that the main counterparty of our uh, corporate PPAs will be the suppliers. What will be the duration of these PPAs and how this will be combined with the balance responsibilities? Are we going to have one counterparty which will also act as an aggregator offering services for our balance responsibilities? Are there going to be two different contracts with two different entities? There are a second bunch of questions related with the market of the PPAs which will be the demand of the, market, of the market, how this will affect the possible risk and the power markets which may be exercised in our market, the possible power of market power which will be exercised. The liquidity is very also important in the market. If we have some corporate PPAs of a limited duration, five, six, 10 years, are we going to have at the end, at the, at the, at, at the end of these PPAs a market, a liquid market which will permit us to, to, to have another extension of these PPAs. And of course, what will be the competition, which is very important for us. I mean, the competition from the demand side, which is very important for the sector in order to understand how uh, safe, how much safe will be, uh, will, will feel in the financing of our projects. There are institutional questions. How the evolution of the, cor the corporate Market, the, the, how the evolution of the market of the corporate PPAs is related with the design of, the, of our wholesale market, especially the forward market. And how is this related with the auction? PPAs are a completely competitive tool against auction. No, I think they can be combined. They can, uh, according to our, already according to our law, there is of course, it has not been exercised in practice, but there is the possibility for a, for a renewable project to participate in an auction for a part of its capacity. So there are some institutions, some challenging to, to, to improve our institutional framework to permit this combination. And of course, as Virginia told, there are significant uh, questions about the financing, how the project finance scheme will be affected what kind of support on guarantees will be asked from the sponsor? What, be, what will be the cost and the terms of the financing? What is the experience in the other countries? How in the first steps of developing the corporate market, of the, the market of the corporate PPAs, these have been affected? Thank you very much, Panayoti. This um, was the last, uh, the last uh, slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Henry, just before we go further in, into the discussion so that we've got a better picture of what we're talking about, could you take us through the, the principal PPA structures? Yes, yeah, yes, of course. So next, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk you through some of the structures that we've seen in the UK and in other markets. This slide shows a conventional utility structure where the generator sells all of its power to an electricity supplier. In the UK, the, the supplier might be a big six utility. Under the structure, the generator will enter into a PPA with a, super, with a supplier who, generally speaking, will be credit worthy. The supplier will on sell the power to its customers and manage imbalance risk. It's worth noting that although the energy supplier's customers would include corporates, those on sale arrangements will not form part of the transaction perimeter for finance or M&A. Under this type of structure, the PPA might be long term or it might be short term and it might provide an element of price protection, for example, via price floor. Next slide, please. The second, this slide shows uh, what we call a sleeved corporate PPA structure. Under this sleeve structure, the generator enters into a PPA directly with a corporate buyer, such as a manufacturer. And the corporate buyer then enters into a back-to-back -back PPA with an electricity supplier. The benefits of this structure are first that the corporate can buy power direct from the generator without there being any licensing issues and without the corporate needing to sign up to the balancing code. This is because the corporate has back-to-back -back its obligations to the supplier. 
The structure also allows the supplier to take in balance risk within appropriate tolerance levels, which is important for bankability. And the, supplier, and the supplier received an administration fee in return for performing the associated services and taking imbalance risk. Sleeving arrangements can be long or short term and they can be with or without pricing protection. Um, but of course, if, if it's a long term arrangement and the structure is being banked, the credit worthiness of the, uh, of the corporate will be important. Next slide, please. So this slide shows a virtual corporate PPA with a single off taker. It's called a virtual PPA because there's no actual physical sale of electricity. Rather, the PPA is in effect a financial hedge against an agreed index with the brand power being sold under a separate route to market PPA. The benefit of this structure is that it's very flexible, particularly in the context of term pricing structures and the fact that the power does not need to be used in the local market. Or to put it another way, it could allow a Greek project company to enter into a financial hedge, hedge with a corporate that doesn't <clears throat> need to consume the power in Greece. Next slide, please. This slide shows a generator with virtual corporate PPAs for multiple off takers. We've included to show this slide, we, we've included this short slide to show it's possible to split offtake bet between multiple corporates via multiple virtual corporate PPAs. There's also a structure called a private wire structure. We don't actually have a slide for this, but I'll mention it briefly. Um, a private wire is where a generator simply sells its power direct to a corporate offtaker without using the grid. Under a private wire structure, the generator is in effect a captive power plant. The main advantage of the structure is that there are usually cost savings associated with not using the network, but there are associated issues, including in relation to stranded asset risk and ability to um, spill excess capacity to the grid. So overall, those are the structures that we've seen in the UK. And it's, it's worth noting that I've seen um, um, structures used in other markets as well. For example, I've, I've worked on deals in Spain, Finland, Swe Sweden, Norway, um, and, and Portugal, which have had virtual PPAs. And we're seeing a lot of those um, on a pan-European basis at the moment. Thank you, Henry. Um, can I just ask um, Zosia, perhaps? Um, the light source BP white paper on corporate PPAs that you uh, issued last year noted that um, across the glo global corporate PPA market, um, risk allocation is the main challenge to buyers and sellers. And whilst there are possible fixes, how to identify, quantify, allocate, and manage risk continues to be a tricky balance. Could, could you take us through, perhaps, to start with the, the principle? risks and challenges to the, the sellers of electricity in the first instance? Um, yes, sure. So I think from a seller's perspective, um, I always think about it as, as how the contract's going to start, what's going to happen during the contract and, and what happens when the contract comes to an end. Um, and then break down the, the various risks through those phases. So the key thing at the beginning is, is ensuring that the contract is in place um, in time for the project to be financed and constructed. So you have risks there around the project timing um, and also the buyer's readiness and ability to execute the PPA. Um, and, and that's sort of pre-contract, um, but making sure that both sides are actually able to fulfill upon a negotiation and, and get a PPA approved and signed off can be quite challenging. These things take some time. Um, and then as part of that, the credit risk of the buyer would be an important consideration for the seller um, prior to the start of the project, again, to ensure the financing of that um, project um, and that the uh, target COD, so the target commencement of the PPA um, can be achieved on time. I think then during the PPA itself, um, some of the key risks are around volume um, and how um, both sort of long term and short term um, volume management is dealt with. So balancing and shape and availability and, and how those uh, risks are allocated and dealt with within the PPA. Um, and in recent years, we've seen 
a move away from sort of standard as generated PPAs where the buyer will take both kind of shape and, and balancing risk uh, to um, alternative structures where a seller is, is holding some of that risk, such as baseload PPAs um, and, and even moving to as consumed PPAs where we're, we're taking even more volume risk. Um, and then at the end, it's if there's a termination event um, for whatever reason, and, and today I haven't seen a, a uh, face this in a corporate PPA or, or any kind of long-term PPA, but if there is a termination risk, how termination event, how is that dealt with? And that's a key negotiation point within the PPA as well. Thank you. So, Thomas, do you want to take us through the key risks if you're the buyer on the on on the buy side? Yep. Sure, and I think the risks from the buyer side are are actually quite similar to what Joseph just mentioned for, for the seller, just the really the opposite side of, uh, of the table. So before the contract starts, even before it's signed, you as a buyer have the questions of you know, which project will actually get financing, um, which type of developer is able to negotiate and get all the approvals to, to enter into the contract. So that's one of the, even before the contract starts together with you know, how sure are you that this developer or the eventual owner of the project has the credit standing to, to ensure that the long-term PPA, and usually these are you know, 10 plus year contracts, will have the ability to properly operate and deliver the power if it's a physical PPA or to make the financial settlements if it's a uh, financial PPA. And then in incredibly important is the, the allocation of that shape and volume risk uh, also for, for the buyer. It's almost certain that a, a buyer doesn't consume electricity exactly in the same way that a renewable plant produces electricity. They don't consume more when it's windy or only when the sun is shining. So there will be a decision to make whether the buyer should bear that shape risk or look at something that has a more predictable, either a a fixed shape delivery, or even in some cases, a full base load, so a full flat delivery, which then resembles more of the, the type of hedging contracts one might find on, on the exchange. And internally, it might be easier to get approval for, for that type of PPA. And then of course, the, the termination is, is a both way, way risk that both sides have to consider and ensure that if a termination happens, not only that, that we describe what the financial consequences might be, but how in practice you might go around finding a the replacement cost of a PPA in a market with low PPA liquidity, or if there's no futures market out 10 years, how do you really set a, a price in practice? So those are quite important uh, points to, to discuss early on. Thank you. So you referred to uh, long-term PPAs there, PPAs of over 10 years, but we know there are short-term PPAs as well. Um, so what, what's the distinction between the short-term and the long-term and, and what are you seeing in other European markets? Um, it's, it's, it's a fine gray line of where short-term and long-term switch our Swedish PPA of 29 years is definitely a, a long-term PPA. I think that qualifies as long in, in everyone's book. Increasingly, we do see PPAs down 10 to 15 year range. And I think those particularly from the buyer side are, are still seen as, as very long contracts when, when buyers are used to buying perhaps year ahead or even, even shorter in, in some cases. But then when we look at PPAs down to three to five years, from our point as a seller, those become less or more difficult to, to use for financing. And so we might use those in combination with another longer term PPA. So we have some cases where you have a, a shorter term PPA and a longer term PPA. But for us, it's really that revenue security that is on the seller side, uh, quite, quite important. And that, that tenor is a important point to, to discuss. So uh, in the... Uh, I was, going to add something. I was going to say seven years seems to be, um, for, for whatever reason, a, um, a, a term which um, banks struggle with. It, 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 I, what I found recently is that banks can struggle to take a view on offtake credit rating beyond year seven. 
unless someone's investment grade. So that, that for me in the UK is affecting structuring quite a lot. So perhaps that, that's a, a, a good uh, question then for, for all of you, uh, Henry Thomas and Zosia in particular. Um, most of the funding in the Greek renewables market up to now has taken place with Greek banks uh, who have got no experience uh, in, in corporate PPAs. Um, how is this going to affect the rollout of corporate PPAs and, and what, what do they need to do to, to prepare? What, what will be the, the key criteria for them and, and what they will be able to finance? I mean, I can't imagine that they're going to be able to be comfortable with financing anything under the 10 years, but you know, your, your experience in new markets, what, what does that show you? I can start there if, help, if helpful, and I know that um, my colleagues in our development and structured finance teams are having active conversations um, with banks in, in Greece and, and in, in Europe more generally um, around financing terms. Um, I think it, it goes back to the point made earlier that um, PPAs can be combined with auction or, or, or used in isolation, so I think there'll be potentially an education process and a journey to go on to look at um, overall the revenue profile of a project or a portfolio of projects um, and, um, and then getting comfortable with the overall risk profile of those contracts. So whether that's a portfolio of projects that includes some auction revenues that uh, are more long-term and stable and um, familiar um, some potential utility PPAs, which um, the off-taker will be, um, and the contract itself will probably be quite standard and cre credit worthy, but there may not be that much depth in that marketplace. And then some corporate PPAs where certainly uh, the tenor and the credit worthiness of the buyer are going to be key considerations. Um, and the overall sort of risk profile and complexity of that PPAs also going to be something that is often in new markets challenging to get lenders comfortable with. Um, but, but I do think as the corporate PPA market has matured over the last couple of years, um, you know, it's fairly established now. There are some, um, there are some certain sort of norms and, and standardization in the corporate PPAs themselves and familiarization that should hopefully aid that, that process and make it easier for lenders to get comfortable with the contracts. Um, as the risk profiles are probably more accepted now than they have been historically. And it goes, it, go, it goes without saying that things like leverage levels affect bankability. If you're, if you're going for very high leverage, obviously it's harder for banks to, to take views if, if the leverage is lower. And it's also worth noting that, that you might see innovative um, financing structures implemented that make it easier to take longer term views, including um, hard and soft mini perms as with, with potentially with cash sweeps as opposed to fully amortizing structures. Right. And I think Henry's mention of the, the cross border use of virtual PPAs is also one that, that might be applicable in the, in the Greek market. There are a number of global and European entities that have some PPA experience um, and they because Greece is part of the association of issuing bodies or the AIB they they might certainly look to Greece as a source of renewable energy that might then uh, be used to to green their operations across Europe and having at least a, a buyer that is, is comfortable with with the terms and comfortable working with banks may also help that process in the, in the discussion. Um. You spoke about the uh, increasing standardization of, of PPAs because my understanding is that historically they've been incredibly complex documents to negotiate. Are, are you seeing a more standard approach um, that will be mean uh, uh, in, in, in other markets? Are, are, are we moving towards a, a standard document or, or are, are these agreements still under development? So I doubt there'll ever be a standard document. I know there have been moves to create some standards. So there's um, probably um, 
a standardization in certain approaches or familiarization with certain ways of doing things within PPAs. But in my view, I doubt we'll move to um, a full standardization. But the, the point that Thomas made there around the cross-border virtual PPAs and that there are a, no a number of large global buyers who are rolling out very similar corporate PPAs in multiple markets and jurisdictions around the world um, is, I suppose, aiding that standardization. Um, and we're starting to see with virtual PPAs, some of the nuances of each physical market don't need to be captured within that, that agreement itself. They're dealt with in the route to market PPA. So that does um, help keep things a little bit simpler um, and stand, uh, allow a little bit more standardization between marketplaces. Yeah, and, and, and in some cases for the, for, for the swap part of the deal rather than the, um, rather than the route to market. Part of the deal in, in, in quite a few markets where something to see is the PPA, it, it, you know, is the documentation used, and I suppose that does offer an element of standardization. Although the route to market piece is going to be um, local, and, and, and terms around shaping and volume risk are going to be bespoke as well. Yeah, um, I can imagine that some of the uh, developers, Greek developers and bankers listening to this discussion, might be. Uh, feeling a little overwhelmed. Um, are you seeing brokers and consultants being involved in the uh, in helping uh, generators, uh, sellers to, to negotiate these agreements? From our side, we, we do. I think there's consultants that are helping really both sides or even all sides of, of that discussion, both on the developer side, the consultants helping bring experience from from other markets, where it's the whether it's the UK or, or the Spanish or Italian markets, for example, and then you also have consultants helping helping the buyers on their side, helping them understand the the structures and the risks and the uses for their procurement. And when you start having consultants on on multiple sides with experience from other markets, I think you're in a relatively good place to ensure that you can you can land a contract that that will will work. I don't know, Henry, if you've seen that many consultants, particularly specifically helping banks, but I'm, I'm sure those exist out there as well. Yeah, no, I I, I agree, Thomas. You, you do see consultants and <clears throat> and you see law firms as well with you know with experience of negotiating these contracts in lots of different different markets because because you can take lessons learned in say Scandinavia or Portugal and apply them in different in different markets. But 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 I think I think bringing it bring it back to some very high level simple perspective. I I, I think a, a, you know one thing to take away is if you have a virtual PPA, in effect, you don't need to find someone in Greece to provide the price protection. It could be an international player who's, who who doesn't need to use the the the, the power in Greece. So that potentially deals with issues around the fact that there, there isn't a large heavy manufacturing base in Greece or, or other, or, you know, very obvious traditional offtake sources in Greece. Can I ask the panel a bit more about credit support generally and how that's been done? I know that there's a, uh, a new Spanish system which is giving state support to uh, industrial users uh, for uh, P, uh, corporate PPAs. Uh, what would you expect to see both on the buy side and on the sell side uh, in Greece? I, I'd say that's probably quite hard to answer in standard terms and that the credit support requirements are usually um, uh, driven by the nature of the PPA. So whether it be virtual or physical, how long the PPA is and the nature of the off taker as well. So it's, it's normally um, uh, an output of, of a number of assessments um, of the overall uh, PPA and the buyer rather than there being sort of hard and fast guidelines. But typically the ideal is to look for um, investment grade uh, security for the obligations under the PPA. Um, that the buyer is taking on, um, which ultimately looks at paying the, the PPA or, or standing behind the um, strike price for the term of the PPA or a termination of payment if there's a, an event of default. 
Um, so that that would probably you know give you a guide as the, the standard approach. It's also worth noting that the seller might need to provide credit support as well, and I, I don't know if that would be a new thing in Greece. Very much so. <laughs> because because you know, for example. Um, the, the off-taker might be concerned that the seller may struggle to meet a termination payment, particularly if the, if the PPA is terminated before COD. So it might look for the generators, banks to post an LC as part of the senior financing, or you might even see, uh, you might see an LC come from outside the financing structure, or you might even see a seller grant second ranking security in favor of the off taker. So you need to, <clears throat> depending on the, on the potential mark to markets, you, you, you might well see sellers needing to post form of collateral. Hannah Yodi, you had a question. Yes, uh, we have a question from Mario Zakas from Vestas, which was also one of my comments I would like to say about the cross border corporate PPAs. Marius is asking if it is doable because it will be very interesting. My question is how is this connected with the um, physical, our physical interconnections? Are we speaking only for financial arrangement, financial contracts, or these cross-border corporate PPAs are limited from the capacities of our international ecosystem, our international interconnections? Because as you know, Greece is a relative isolated country with uh, lack, with limited. Uh, international connection. There is an ambitious plan, an ambitious plan, an ambitious plan for uh, expansion of these connections, but we still will need to work on this. So, how, how, yeah. how this corporate PPA is, is affected by the physical interconnections? So, the contract itself will not be particularly affected by the physical interconnections. So, it will be a financial settlement um, from mm -hmm. seller to buyer, from buyer, buyer to seller. However, it's important to note that if there are no interconnections um, between markets, then there will be highly likely less correlation between the prices and there may be increased risk that the prices in between the two markets being discussed mm -hmm. are moving in different directions. And if Europe had perfect interconnection, all the prices would be the same and there would be no basis risk. So the, the less interconnection perhaps you have more basis risk to consider, but contractually, there's no there's no requirement for for physical interconnection between the markets. Correct. Thank you. Good point. I have not thought about that. Correct. And the virtual PPA would not necessarily be related to the to the Greek market price at all, Thomas. Correct. That is is certainly a point to. To negotiate, I think from the seller's perspective, from the bank's perspective, we would need, want, uh, request or, or require the, the income from the route to market contracts so or from the sale of the physical electricity to actually be effectively hedged through that virtual PPA. So we would want the index to be the same, but of course that means that the counterparty is then uh, taking some decisions on, on the basis between the market of origin, so Greece, and then the market to which they're transferring or in which they actually consume the power. So in a new market like Greece, I would, I would expect the first PPAs to be uh, linked to the, the Greek index. Okay. Um, for the virtual PPAs, uh, the guarantees of origin are significant, presumably. And availability of guarantee, uh, guarantees of origin. Yes, yeah, so where, where we're talking about these virtual cross border PPAs, the, the power itself isn't necessarily going to travel, um, but the, the buyer's going to, the, the rationale for the buyer procuring the green energy is still there, and they're going to want to secure those guarantees of origin, most likely, um, as one of the key drivers for that um, participating in that PPA. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, um, Greece is part of a, a European-wide scheme, the, the Association of Issuing Bodies, which will allow those um, guarantees of origin to travel and be um, used in other markets, essentially. So those will be, um, and, and that's critical to enabling these cross-border PPA, 
PPAs. And those will be a sort of a key component, maybe not the headline, um, you know, the headline of the PPA, but very much a key component of the PPA is the guarantees of origin. Yeah. Can I, I just remind uh, those attending that we've got 15 minutes left. And if you do have any more questions, please put them up in the, in the Q&A function uh, and I will ask them directly to our panel members. Um, in the, the Greek, if I can just ask at the moment, the, the, the Greek regulatory authority has imposed a limit of 20% on the amount uh, of electricity which a vertical supplier can cover by um, bilateral PPAs for the period up to the end of this year in order to preserve the liquidity of the market. Um, do, do you see that in other markets? Is that common? <laughs> Evidently not. <laughs> I was look, looking at Henry for, for that one, but I don't think I've seen that particularly. Um, and I, I guess question to what's in Farley team is, is how that is limited to perhaps physical PPAs per, compared to even through suppliers and, and is the backed um, kind of swap, which might still be available uh, for developers. So it depends on, on how these regulations exactly are. are I think worded. it's principally related to the, uh, to the nature of the market and uh, still the very dominant position of uh, PPC. So I, I think it's probably there aren't necessarily equivalents in, in, in other markets so much. Um, when you've got your main revenue through a, a, a PPA, does, does this affect the, the other parts of the contractual structures for the construction of, of an, a renewable energy um, project, Henry? Does, uh, how, how does the, the contractual structure and um, the arrangements with the bank differ from the uh, structure that uh, you would expect in a situation that we have at the moment of effectively a fairly fixed price through the market through the operating support system or the feeding tariff. Sure. Well, well, well simplistically, if you've if you um, if you're signing up to a uh, a corporate PPA which has long term delivery requirements and, and long term um, requirements around volume and shape, you you need to make sure that your plant is going to be able to perform to those levels. So. When it comes to the construction documents and um, m documents, as a generator, you're you're going to want to see um, the the contractual um, matrix back those back those obligations, and also you, you're you're going to be able to want to hold the um, the construction contractors feet to the fire around delivering the plant on time. So yes, the, 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 the PPA terms, um, it, it, you know, assuming the virtual PPA is, is key to the, um, to, to the revenues moving forward, you, the, um, the generator is gonna wanna see the, the project contract terms match the PPA and the banks also Going to be interested in that and it's probably going to want direct agreements as well so it can it can step in potentially if there's a problem so that's that's the first very high level piece to note i guess the second high level piece to note is that when it comes to the finance documents the debt is going to be um sized to a large extent to um the pricing parameters agreed in the um in the PP, in, in in the virtual PPA, so so, so really those that those the, the 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 level of protection is going to be key towards the level of leverage that um, the bank's prepared to give, and it's certainly going to be the, a, a funder is certainly going to be more conservative around sizing assumptions when the uh, when the PPA expires. We've got a question in our Q&A uh, of why do a virtual uh, 
CV, which I'm not sure what it means, in Greece, if you can do it in Spain or Sweden at a lower price. Um, I mean, on an international cross-border basis, how significant is the energy price here in Greece in comparison to uh, the energy prices in other countries? And, and how does that work on a competitive basis? I mean, I, I can probably start and then Thomas has probably got more experience in, in the Scandinavian markets. Um, but I think when you look at the value of a PPA, you consider not just um, uh, the price of the power, in a virtual PPA, the differential between the spot market and the strike price. And that's that's how um, both a, a buyer and a seller would, would value that PPA. Um, so um, in absolute terms, um, whether the power, uh, for example, with solar, whether you can deliver a lower LCOE in Spain than in Greece is important, but it's also important to consider the differential between that that, that PPA price and, and where the spot price is trading. And, and although last year was a very um, uh, low price year in Greece as mentioned, um, I think in general that the sort of long-term price forecast or the medium-term price forecast in Greece is, is quite high compared to some other European markets. So there's potentially value there. Um, but, but also, you know, the question why is, is a function not only of price, but also preference. So we do see some buyers who have, um, clusters of demand around Europe and may not want to be um, solely exposed to, say, the Spanish market with basis risk linked to all of the other markets within Europe. They may be able to minimise their basis risk by having um, a Greek PPA um, providing the load for uh, providing the renewable energy for their load in, in potentially, you know, Southeastern Europe and the Balkans. So it, it, it's, it's a function of price and preference and how um, basis risk can be managed as well, I'd say. Absolutely, and I think the one other point on the virtual PPA is that some of the buyers who are doing this in order to, to green electricity procurement and in order to, to manage costs, but are also looking to enable new renewable energy to to be built. So there may be some buyers out there with, with a motivation to really enable and, and to participate in opening up the, the Greek market. So if one chooses Greece over Spain, one might be just paving the way a little bit more for, for the market to develop than, than doing another PPA in, in Spain. So that may be a motivation also for some buyers to, to lead the way here. So we've, we've been talking a lot about virtual PPAs uh, and the uh, cross-border. But if I can just talk a little bit more about, or ask you to talk a little bit more about uh, the, the bilateral contracts within the market here in Greece. Um, the expectation would be presumably that a, a lot of the contracts would be with electricity suppliers who would, uh, through the a sleeve PPA system, is, is, is that your expectation? I think either through a sleeved PPA arrangement, um, as Henry showed in, in his slides, that is directly with a corporate and the credit risk of the seller and, and the buyer directly between each other. So that is one, one route that might be possible. And the other is that uh, a developer could enter into a PPA with a supplier say for a 10 year contract and the supplier might might take some risk on, on buying that power and then looking to to tranche it up into smaller pieces perhaps into short tenors and looking to sell on to their customers where the then the buyer the developer doesn't have necessarily any relationship with the final consumer and i think that type of utility ppa is, is certainly a model that will also develop in in greece and, and the, I, I wouldn't necessarily rule out private wire um, offtakes as well. If you've got the right type of offtake, you, they're particularly if you've got some kind of regulated entity that you, where you can take a long-term credit view, like um, I don't know a water company or, or or an airport, that could be interesting as well. And what role do the aggregators play here? Are, are you expecting the the agreements to be between? generators themselves or, or perhaps between the aggregators and the suppliers? 
I think there's there's always a role um, for, for aggregators within markets to, um, you know, as mentioned, to help sort of break up that um, load if we're seeing, for example, large scale, um, large utility scale um, projects and, you know, strong yield um, in Greece, for, certainly for solar. So, you know, large tra tranches of energy, there's a role for aggregators to play in, in, in both sides of the market and, and facilitating that. Um, and, and back to those sort of the utilities and the role that the utilities can play in a physical PPA, whether directly or indirectly, you always require a utility or a sleeving partner or an aggregator, whatever, um, you know, name we give them, but there needs to be someone who's actually physically active in that market and enabling that market and dealing with balancing um, and the physical aspects of participating in that wholesale market. So there'll always be a role there to be played. And in fact, with um, a virtual PPA, that, that role still needs to be fulfilled as well. Yes, it's a, perhaps this is a question for you, Panayoti. Um, uh, it's a question from uh, Marianne Anton in our London office who, uh, notes that uh, a lot more state bodies are getting involved in renewable PPAs uh, and whether this would be something which could be um, taken up in, in Greece. Um, what do you think? Look, it would be very a very nice idea of course, I don't know the legal question about how, how the restriction about pub, how, how what kind of restriction applies to public bodies in order to procure power. Uh, still, we encourage the public authorities and especially the local authorities to have such kind of green energy. One year ago, we had also made a proposal to offer um, to bring in contact the wind park with the local authorities in order to transfer them guarantee of origins to prove that their consumption is green. Um, of course, this uh, the question refers to something more broader. Uh, I think that we have um, uh, steps to, to achieve this. I mean, um, we are in the first step of this uh, steps of this market, corporate PPAs in Greece. I do not expect that the local authority or a local municipality, which is by definition a conservative body, to, to make the first step. Yes. First, we need as market to build this market and then demonstrate this to local authorities. This is my comment on that. Is it, is it widely seen, Thomas, also in, in other European countries apart from, apart from the UK? I can't think of any... Um specific case studies today but I think there is definitely growing interest um, uh, that definitely I've seen it in the UK but I think there's growing interest in other markets as well I'm sure after this I'll remember some examples <laughs> I, I agree I think it's quite a, a limited part of of the market I'm not 100% sure but I think some of the Swedish municipalities might some years ago have entered into some form of PPA or perhaps it was a guarantee of origin contract uh, as well so i think it there's certainly interest there and um it may certainly grow yeah i've seen the uk you've seen local community it's not quite not quite state bodies but you've seen local community groups get together and say ensure that their municipalities powered with with, with renewables yeah but that's probably close to retail level yeah there's the City of London in the UK who signed a long-term corporate PPA as an example, the Corporation of the City of London. So there has been some at scale. Um, I'm just, yeah, and, and historically, you know, there, there have been some public sector contracts, certainly, but um, I think it will continue to grow, but be a steady part of the market because PPAs by their very nature take a long term to negotiate and, and that sector also tends to, um, can move at a fairly steady pace. Okay. Well, um, we've uh, we've used up our hour. Um, it's been really, really interesting, uh, and 
I, I'm sure that uh, everyone will come up with lots of questions they'd wish they asked uh, afterwards. So um, if there are further follow-up questions, um, please feel free to send them to me and I will try and uh, <laughs> pursue our panel members to, to give you an answer if, if we can. Um, I'd like to thank all of my panel members uh, and our very large audience today uh, for taking the time to join us uh, and to discuss this uh, very interesting topic. Um, we will follow up with all of the uh, participants with an email, including the slides uh, and a short feedback, feedback survey. So uh, please, we'd be grateful if you could respond on that so that we can make sure that we're, we're covering your interests. Uh, if you've dialed in, if you could please send an email to events at wfw.com so we can track your attendance and send you the slides as well. Uh, that would be great. So um, I'd just like to thank then uh, Panayotis, Thomas, Zosia, Henry for joining me today. And um, I uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks very much.